Before we get to questions, we've got some samples. And Wayne, you said this is a really rare creature. Well, at least in Nebraska, it's fairly rare. I need to give a shout out to my master gardener, Marjorie Jansen, who brought this in from her garden. This is what is known as a Spurge Sphinx Moth. Um, I just checked today down in the entomology department, and it's the third record from the state Wow! Um, that we have. It was introduced to help control leafy spurge. And unfortunately, she found a few of them on her garden spurge that she has. And, and not a major problem. The horn on the back is soft. It won't poke you. Uh, the coloration is probably more for warning of to birds. Hey, I've been eating on this plant that's got some nasty compounds in it. You eat me, I'm going to taste better, do something nasty to you. And so that's what the red's for. It can be separated from the gallium sphinx moth by this red stripe that goes all the way down the back. Very pretty. And it would be great if it would actually gobble up that leafy spurge, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah. People would love it if it did. <laughs> Thanks, Wayne. All right, Zach, we have fertilizer. It's not much of a sample, but uh, <laughs> it is time. It's time to fertilize our lawns. Uh, there's two. There's three more things to do at this time of the year. It's a, it's a great time to fertilize your lawns. Uh, Any time now looks like it's going to cool off next uh, next week, so next week's a great time to start fertilizing your lawn. Uh, urea is, or nitrogen is the primary uh, nutrient that we want to we want to apply. Uh, lots of times you'll see fall fertilizers or so-called winter fertilizer. This is a winterizer fertilizer. This happens to be a so-called winter fer fertilizer. They include, often will include phosphorus and potassium. And unless you have a soil test that reveals a, a, a potassium or phosphorus deficiency, there's really no sense in putting that down. You can go with almost straight nitrogen if you can, or, or certainly low amounts of, of uh, uh, P and K. And so this one, I believe, is a uh, 24012. I like the numbers uh, 2403 or 24 or something of that nature. Uh, that's probably a better general use uh, fertilizer. Again, probably uh, in the next uh, week or so, preferably get, if we get some rain, that would be great. Water it in after you apply it. And then about the last week or so of October, or near the last mowing is the last time you should put it down on your cool season lawns. And don't do it this weekend when it's 100 degrees. You, uh, I probably would not do it this weekend when it's 100 degrees. I'll be seeding this weekend instead. It's a better time to seed. <laughs> okay, thanks, Zach. Amy, dinky little sample of a really problem. Dinky spot. little sample, yeah. I brought it in brown patch on turf. Um, I know in the Lincoln area you've probably been seeing it for a while, but up in O'Neill, uh, this has really just popped up in the last uh, couple weeks. Um, this is K31 tall type fescue, which I grabbed, which is great because you're actually able to see it. The trick with brown patch is you're going to see the really dark brown lesion surrounding that really tan lesion on the inside. It can go all the way across the blade, partial, um, and just blotch all over the leaf. The big thing what you see in your lawn is you're going to kind of see a general browning of the lawn in those areas. You just have to get on your hands and knees. Uh, that's what all good turf people do is get on your hands and knees and take a closer look at what's going on on those blades. Some people think it's just getting dry and will add more water, but it's actually the spots. Um, the trick with brown patch is it likes warmer weather. Uh, so if next week is as cool as what they're predicting, it usually likes anywhere between 80 degrees and above. Um, if we're only in highs of the 70s, it's not going to be a major problem. The lawns that we seed in uh, with Kentucky bluegrass are the ones that are over fertilized in the spring. Lawns that are really lush with growth. Um, so if you've had a problem, uh, you want to make sure you're putting your fertilizer down in the fall, like Zach was just talking about, and not putting most of it down in the spring. And you can come in with a curative fungicide application if need be. But at this point in time in the year, probably not worth it, worth the hassle at all. So, All right. Thanks, Amy. Elizabeth. A new pretty plant. I do have a new pretty plant. At this time of the year, we have a lot of perennials that are really doing their flower show. And the Goldstrom Rubecchias or the Black Eyed Susans, um, they're one of the ones that right now they look really either really ragged or really nice. This is a new variety called Little Gold Star. It's that 14 to 16 inches um, tall or 14 to 16 inches wide. Lots of little smaller flowers on there. We really don't know a lot about it. If it's gonna look a little bit nicer later in the season than the, the Goldstrom Rubecchias or if it's gonna have the similar types of issues. Um, but it's a, a new one to try a little bit smaller, a little bit more compact and a lot of little tiny flowers scattered throughout the whole, whole plant. And a lot of our gardeners like anything new. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that'll be fun. All right, thanks, gang. You get the first picture. 
This is a Columbus viewer who has an insect that she said first appeared on her husband's Joe Pie weed, and then it flitted away to something else, and she thought it was really quite beautiful. She wonders what it is, and is it a good guy or a bad guy? Well, we'll put it this way. <laughs> it is an Elianthus webworm. Um, generally, uh, it's a native insect that does a real number on a non-native host, the uh, see, Tree of Heaven, uh, oh. Stinky Sumax. I can't remember all the names that that plant has, uh, but that's what they feed on. They feed in a web on there. Um, not a major problem typically, but definitely nice to look at. So if somebody wants to get rid of t Tree of Heaven, they need that. Yes. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> All right, um, Zach, we've had this question two or three times now that we're headed into the, the fall of the year, but this particular viewer sent an excellent picture and wants to know what is it and how to control it before it gets into all the pads of his dog's feet. Uh, uh, that's sand burr and uh, grows on sandy soils. It's a real problem on, on, on thin soils and primarily on sandy soils. Unfortunately, right now you can't do anything with it. The best control is uh, uh, pendimethin or a pre-emergent herbicide applied in the, fall, in the spring, applied early in the spring, and, uh, and best to make two applications. We do have a, a fairly large research study on sand burr right now. I, I'd have to shoot you if I told you the results. But uh, well, actually, I'm not comfortable. I, I honestly not comfortable with the results yet. Uh, we don't have enough years of enough enough data. But uh, the best the best bet right now is pendimethalin in the spring. All right, and unfortunately, that sand burr shows up in an awful lot of waste areas or public areas where there's probably no control. Lots of yeah. parks. Uh, I get a lot of questions from playgrounds, right. and right. The, the the kids find them. That's in their bad. feet, yeah, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. That's why we're working on it. Excellent. All right, Amy, this is a viewer who has liatris, mm -hmm. or one of the gay feathers. Uh, she got this plant in, in Minnesota and uh, trucked it back down. We're not sure where she's from, but she thought it was a sun scorch, and then she's thinking, well, maybe it's, maybe it's not. Is this a fungal disease on liatris? What should she do about this? It looks like it's a fungal disease. I can't tell you exactly which one it is um, without taking a closer look. Um, there's about two or three that can develop on this plant species. The big trick is you brought it from Minnesota to here. It can move over to other gay feathers uh, in your landscape, most likely. It most likely won't move to any other non-host or different plant species as a whole. Um, if you want to manage it this fall, make sure you do really good sanitation uh, and make sure you get rid of all that leaf residue. That's where the spores will overwinter and that'll probably be your best bet. And if you start seeing it next spring or early summer, you may want to come in with a fungicide application, but it shouldn't spread to any other plants besides the gay feathers that are in that landscape. All right, thanks Amy. Uh, Elizabeth, you have a couple of images that a viewer took on the Oak, Tree, Oak Creek Trail out by Valparaiso. Uh, they don't know what they are, and I think we've figured out at least most of what they are. We figured out most of what they are. The first one that you're seeing there, that big, bold, leafed one, is called a cup plant, um, and it's got that really big, bold texture. The second one we had a little bit of an issue with. Um, we did know <coughs> for sure that it's a clematis, um, just because of the way that the seed heads look like little hairy beards on there. So we know for sure it's a clematis, but when it comes down exactly which one it is, we'd need to see more of a sample um, to get the proper identification down to species. All right, next picture for you. This is one we always get a lot of this time of year. Um, she sent pictures and she said, what? are these and there they are in all their mm -hmm. glory all over yep. everything in the aster family yep, yep. what are yep. they they are <laughs> you have to tell us <laughs> yeah, just keep saying yep yeah. <laughs> they are the some sometimes they're called goldenrod leather wings um that's the for this particular species of soldier oh. beetle soldier there beetle refers to a whole f host of species this particular one is chelionathus pennsylvanicus Soldier beetles. Can you spell yeah. that for us, please? <laughs> you probably could. Don't get it. No, started. I don't want. I, can't, I retract the question. <laughs> but we are seeing them all over, and I think people think they're After lightning bugs. After the show, bugs. Zach, I'll spell it for you. Yeah, I think people think they're lightning bugs. That's usually where they're asking. Mm, yeah, we're a little late in the year for lightning bugs. Yeah, very cool. All right, you get an ID, Zach. Um, this is a viewer who sent us a couple of images. Not much to go on other than the foliage on this one, and she's really wanting to know what it is and whether it is a good guy or a bad guy. 
Uh, well, uh, any any weed is in the eye of the beholder, so it could be a good guy, it could be a bad guy, depending on what it looks like. In your, it looks like it's a, it looks like it's in a bed or is in either that or a really ter thin turf stand. Yeah. Uh, maybe a burdock or something like that. Uh, most likely a perennial, I would guess. Uh, applications in uh, broadleaf herbicide in the fall would work if it's too close to other uh, broadleaf uh, desired broadleaf plants. Uh, wick it on with a glove or, or something like that. Elizabeth thinks it's cat briar. Could be. Could be. RQA veins on there. And Bo uh, yeah. Could be a rudbeckia that yeah. got I would, uh, uh, I would defer to the horticulturist. <laughs> we'll wait for a bloom. Personally me, I would, <laughs> we I, need would a just, flower. I would just mow it. Probably take care of a good chunk of it. There you go. All right. But we Thanks. don't always want to mow the ornamental beds is what the horticulturists tell the turf guy. They're wrong. <laughs> We, we never want to mow the ornamental beds. Zach. They're wrong. They're wrong. <laughs> All right. Turn everything into turf. It's better Amy, that way. quickly before you okay. get on the rant. This is a viewer that has uh, an elm. She says at least 92 years old uh, because she has a picture of it that was taken in 1921 and it was maybe an inch around and six mm -hmm. to eight feet tall. Next to a cottonwood, they're both kind of in fair condition. The weather's taken its toll. Now the elm has this going on at the base. Okay. And she's in McCook. Okay. She wants to know what's going on other than it's old. This may be a situation where you don't want to mow everything, Zach. Like, it looks it like it's wrong. You would need a big mower for that, Amy. <laughs> it looks like it's actually had some mower blight at some point in time yeah. in its life. Yeah. Um, but it's <clears throat> weeping and oozing on the side. Uh, probably an indication of some wet rot going on. Uh, the integrity of the tree is starting to go down. Now, what is the integrity of the tree? It's really hard to say. Um, you probably should bring an arborist in to really take a good look at it because the last thing you want is a tree that's that old and I'm assuming would be very large um, if we have a severe winter or ice storm that it would fall on the house or on a building. So I would really suggest you probably should have an arborist come out and take a look at it to check the integrity. And if the integrity is bad, you might want to go ahead and take it down this fall yet. Um, but with that in mind, it's fall and you could go ahead and start thinking about replacing it with another tree this fall or you can look at next spring depending on what you want to go with. But it's a wet rot and it's just indicating that the tree is starting to, de starting to decline and you may start seeing some carpet variants in there also because of it. All right, thanks. I mean that's a, a, a good suggestion to our viewers. If, it, if there is a target for one of those big trees, make sure that it's not your house or your, your car. Yeah. All right. Uh, Elizabeth, we're getting a lot of this both this year and last year. This is a Cairo, Nebraska viewer. Uh, they're saying these shrubs begin to grow out of the top of their dwarf spruce. And I think he sent us three or four pictures. Two of the nine are doing this and you get a really good notion of what's happening there. They want to know what to do to stop it. And dwarf Alberta spruce are a variety of a white spruce. And so what will happen is the dwarf Alberta spruce usually grows about, you know, maybe a half an inch a year. <coughs> Sometimes it just gets a wild hair or an antler where it reverts back to the straight species. And so that's why you're seeing the, the shrub inside this tree. Um, it's just starting to revert back. As soon as you begin to see that, you want to go ahead and prune out that straight species. Because um, what can happen is that straight species grows lots quicker than the dwarf Alberta and you're going to get top heavy and it's going to break off with time. So you want to try to prune it out as soon as you start to see it. Is that going to fix it long term? Who knows if you're going to have to keep going in and, and getting rid of those antlers and getting rid of those shrubs within the shrub. Um, but you could potentially have a, a bald spot there um, if that um, large antler got too big coming out of the tree. So it's just something that we're seeing more and more, mm -hmm. um, but get rid of it as soon as you start to see it so that way you've got a nice full looking little tree. Excellent, and we're also seeing that on other small dwarf uh, species of evergreen. So keep your eye on, if it looks like it's wrong, it probably is. Mm -hmm. Do we wanna do pictures or questions right now, audience? I think we do questions <laughs> instead. We'll just wait. A rounding response from the audience. Both of you out I there, thank it. you for responding. <laughs> All right, so here's a fun one for you, um, Wayne. This is a viewer who lives in Valentine. They had um, a grapevine hedge that had a serious infestation of white fly. They're now traveling, of course, and she's attempting to attack them, attacking stuff. She, um, she's been using sticky traps. She's using neem oil now. She's got, uh, her question really is she's, she's seeing that it is both an RTU or ready to use formulation and a concentrate. So she's confused. Which, which is it? Does she add water or doesn't she? 
All right, when, when I looked this up, and I had to look this one up to make sure I got it right, the, there are two different labels for this particular product. One is the ready to use, and one is the concentrate. The way you can tell them apart if you're getting mixed messages on the label, go to the directions for use part uh, underneath the insecticide portion. And if it just tells you to wet the plant thoroughly and has no mixing instructions, then it's the ready to use. Otherwise, if it starts telling you add two teaspoons per gallon of water or something like that, then you know it's the concentrate and you do have to mix it with water or follow the directions on the label. All right. So just read down a little bit further to see what you need to do. Excellent. Thanks, Wayne. Um, Zach, we had a viewer who actually delivered a sample here of something he thought was rosin weed from Erickson, Nebraska. And the question really, and, and it's sort of all over from all over the state, is why so many of the sunflowers, the rosin weeds, the, all the beautiful yellow stuff everywhere? Uh, yeah, I was, uh, if anybody's been out in the Sand Hills lately, it's, uh, it is the yellow hills of Nebraska. It's, it's pretty amazing. They look, uh, uh, they look fat. <laughs> they're really cool Wonderful. looking. Wonderful. And I think yeah. a, a lot of it, it's just a natural thing where la last year was such a long drought, a hard drought, the heat. Uh, any of the grasses, any of the native grasses out there uh, probably thinned and opened up voids in uh, the stand. And then this year we've had uh, way above average water out there. So anything, any, any of the broad leaves or the, the sunflowers out there that germinated that had very little seedling death. And so they all were successful and so that's what we have. Will it happen again next year? The, the the warm season grasses should start to come back over time. But if you know if we have a dry year, it probably won't be as bad, and it'll probably it'll uh, it'll probably uh, it's an ecology thing. It'll re return back to the grasses here in the next year, two, three years, depending on the weather. So that's one of those really wonderful things to enjoy while it happens. It's it's yes mm -hmm. yeah. yeah excellent thanks Zach, mm -hmm. um, Amy not so wonderful. We have tomato plants. This mm -hmm. person we don't know where they're from, but. <laughs> could be anywhere. They, uh, they were doing really well, loaded with green tomatoes, not turning red, and now they're turning red, but the plant itself is dying, so the tomatoes are hanging there without any foliage. Seems to start from the bottom up, finally consuming the plant. Okay. So are we blight, or are we, it's August, it's time to... <laughs> well, my tomatoes, are, my tomatoes are finally starting to turn colors too, so I'm trying to keep my tomatoes alive. Since it started at the bottom and worked its way up, it could either be satoria leaf spot or early blight. And each of those, you're going to get those brown to black lesions with the yellow halo. And it always starts at the bottom of the plant and works its way up. And, it, and the disease progresses so much that it actually causes the leaves to turn yellow, and then they end up dying, and then you have to pull them off. Um, this time of year, there isn't a lot to do with it if it's progressing up that high. Uh, next year, you want to make sure you're using soaker hoses, mulching as best as possible. But the big trick is once you start seeing it, you need to pinch off those bottom leaves. Um, I know a few gardeners who will prune up until six, eight inches up on the tomato plant once it's well established, just to make sure all those leaves are off the bottom to provide an inoculum source to go up the rest of the plants. And it seems to slow it down a quite a bit. It doesn't get rid of it, but it definitely slows it down. So those are some things to look at for next year. Um, there are some resistant varieties out there. Uh, so if you're starting seed, and you're looking through the, all those seed catalogs this winter, look for something that has resistance to Satoria or early blight, and that would really save a lot of hassle too. But if you're into heirlooms, there is no re resistance in heirlooms, just to give you an FYI there. Right, all right, thanks, Amy. Elizabeth, this is a viewer that has a cottonwood, very large, with a cavity at the base. Apparently it withstood the strong winds earlier, wants to know whether it will actually regrow or, or contain or fix that structural damage or if it is potentially a hazard tree. And again, it depends on when we say <coughs> cavity, how large is the cavity? Um, does it have like the wet rot that Amy was talking about earlier in the show? Does it seem to have a hole? Are there carpenter ants? Those are all things to keep in mind. If you're seeing carpenter ants, more than likely there's dead and decaying wood inside because that's where they make their, their tunnels and galleys and things like that. You know, if the tree is having difficulties maintaining leaves on that side or if it consumes more than a third of the trunk, then at that point in time you might need to think about either contacting an arborist or maybe looking at the overall health of the tree and see if you need to get a replacement tree for it. 
Some trees are able to heal over, but my guess is, is if you have a large cavity on a cottonwood, you're probably gonna get some rot started in there before it has a chance to completely heal over. All right, next picture comes to you, Wayne. This is a viewer who has been growing a cantaloupe and is, is discovering that he's not getting to eat much. And he's seeing what he thinks are slugs and he's calling them wood louse or wood lice and is wondering is there anything that he could do around the fruits themselves and has wondered about diatomaceous earth or something like that. As I look at these two, the two pictures that were up here, Kim, uh, I noticed that the first one had the insects in question, much more easy to see it in the second one. And yeah, wood lice or wood louse if it's a single one, roly polies, isopods, whatever your vernacular term is. Uh, they're generally opportunists, and if they are really getting into the cantaloupes, it's because there's something else going on. Okay. Uh, generally not a direct problem, but usually a sign of something else is going on. I am noticing a lot of uh, mulch down on the, on the ground, and they tend to be concentrated in those high organic areas. So they do like to hide during the day, so they could be hiding underneath that cantaloupe and as a place to hide. And then if away. there is something rotting underneath there, they could be feeding on that. All right, and diatomaceous earth is probably not going to do anything to other than slice They're a their crustacean on top of yeah. that. I'm not sure how well diatomaceous earth would work. Okay. All right. Won't slice their little bodies. All right, Zach, we have a buffalo grass issue here, which would be that it doesn't really look very good. And really the question is control of the buffalo grass now so that it doesn't look like that. Uh, well, there's a couple of things. Number one, there's a bunch of uh, uh, cool season grasses growing in there, and mm -hmm. so uh, uh, a herbicide application in November, a Roundup application in November and December would take care of the, a, a lot of the, the darker green patches. Uh, it's the, uh, the, the, the deadish brown uh, buffalo grass over to the right. Uh, could result from uh, the, the severe drought we had last summer. Even buffalo grass suffered last summer, and, and especially if it had a little bit of traffic or maybe it was in an area that was a, a, a compacted soil or some other stress that caused, uh, that could put buffalo grass over the edge. Uh, uh, how to fix it. Uh, you could you could seed it next. You know you really can't do much now because it's near the end of its its mm -hmm. growing season. So reseed it next next spring. Some of it will come back from the stolons, but good chance you have to reseed it next spring. All right. Thanks, Zach. Um, Amy, this is a viewer that has an oak that they're wondering whether this is a pathogen or is this an environmental stressor. They did say that they left the water accidentally on overnight a week ago. Is it overwatered, or are we seeing some things going on with this red oak that would be of greater concern than <laughs> too much to, water? To me, it doesn't look like overwatering. Uh, the picture right here with the leaves actually looks more like a scorch issue where it wasn't receiving enough water. Mm -hmm. But the first picture that has me more concerned is the top half of the tree has turned colors. Um, to me, that's indicating there's something else going on. Uh, whether you have a canker that is developed on that trunk or we have other issues that's planted too deep. We have roots already girdling. Uh, it looks like it's a fairly new planting, um, so it's potentially it could be a little bit too deep. But the browning on the outside edges is it wasn't receiving enough water. Um, and being on that berm, you have to be really careful to make sure all the water isn't running away. Um, so you wanna make sure you're pushing some of that malt away so the water's gonna actually penetrate down into that root system. And putting the hose out there and not the sprinkler would be a better choice also. Right, and so don't fertilize. Yes, and don't fertilize, thank you. All right, Elizabeth, this is another interesting, what's going on with our evergreens? This is a Loveland, Iowa viewer, sending a picture of an evergreen. You can kind of see it in there, and I think there's a closer one, growing right out of the cut wound on a maple. Wonder, he, he's wondering, will it survive, or should he pull it out of there and plant it, and how did, did it get there in the first place? Well, the first um, thing is, it got there because a lovely bird put it there. Um, those little berries on the juniper are very attractive to birds and then the birds spread them. Um, so that's probably how it got there. You know, your best bet's probably to remove it. It's not going to have a long lifespan there. It's going to run out of um, space for the roots to grow and more than likely it's going to die at some point in time. Um, so if you want to pull it out there, try to transplant it. You can, um, but long term it's not going to have a very long life in, in that tree. This viewer was just creeped out by this particular thing that happened for 
pretty good reason. Um, he found it in the middle of his bathroom. Those are your images. So what we're looking at for our audience is that thing that looks like a white piece of string. He found one in his bathroom and then it rolled itself up in a ball and scooted or wheeled or rolled or tumbled and went fast away. Uh, <laughs> He's got a lot of description here on what it was and wonders what it is and right. where did it come from. <laughs> All right. If, I don't know if they'll back up to that first picture, uh, but this is a horsehair worm. And you can see that it's a nematode. It's one of the largest nematodes. Uh, they can get up to 12 inches long. That particular one in the picture is about 8 inches long. That's about what I could stretch out, and it still wasn't fully extended. And it came out of that little inch and a half long Katie did there next to that dime and they're actually really cool uh, they only infest invertebrate hosts so they're not going to get into anybody or anybody's pet as long as it's not a praying mantis <laughs> and they develop over the course of a year and then the really fun part is when they alter their host's behavior and they drive them to water and when they drive them to water then that um, nematode comes out as the adult and it lays its eggs in the water. And if you go online, you can actually find a lot of videos about them following these things around crickets, katydids, grasshoppers. They drive them into pool, people's pools. These things come out and then they get this big tangled mass and then they lay eggs in the pool. It's, so for someone like me, it's oh. a lot of fun. So when he describes this as an alien invader, he was absolutely right. Yeah. Oh, yes. Ooh. Okay, let's to go to turf. Try let's to contain talk yourself. about turf. <laughs> Holy mackerel, you are sick. <laughs> let's talk turf, please. Okay. <laughs> you get a picture that a viewer sent in, and they have the big Ravenna grass, uh, only two years old. So this this is going to go to this is going to go to you for kind of an interesting reason. The ornamental grasses flourish, obviously, and then some of them flourish and seed themselves about and become control issues. This one probably won't, you're thinking, but I think you have also included some pictures of the fountain grasses. Yeah, these are, uh, and I, I'm a big fan of ornamental grasses, uh, and I love, the, I love the seed heads, and they're great all winter long, and they provide great uh, uh, texture all winter long, and then uh, they'll, either, they'll, they'll uh, either blow off in the fall or blow off in the spring, and a lot of these are, are taking root and surviving in our turf. And uh, generally on the thicker turf, it's not as much of an issue, but our thinner turfs around the, uh, uh, the ornamental bed sometimes will, uh, these guys will, will germinate, and it doesn't seem like the pre-emergent herbicides have much effect on these, on some of these these grasses. I'm not sure how many of the grasses are actually doing it. We have most uh, uh, most experience with penicetum or fountain grass, and uh, there's a, a picture of uh, fountain grass right there. You can control these if it's it's if it's problematic to you. You can control them with uh, wicking on Roundup with the the glove of death, or we found on this particular one penicetum. Uh, that uh, drive or quinclorac applied at uh, 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 about three ounces per gallon, spot applied at three ounces per gallon, is uh, pretty effective. All right, thanks, Zach. Uh, Amy, you get uh, an interesting picture too. This is a viewer who thought she had a hackberry, it's actually elm, but it's got this big old large spot on the trunk that seems to be leaking onto the ground and discoloring, doesn't show any other signs of problems. She wants to know a course of action here. Prune okay. it, she's concerned with spread. Just like we talked about earlier in the show, it's another sign of wet rot. Um, that branch, the integrity of the branch is not very good. Um, most likely you're probably in the next year or two, you might see some mushroom conks developing on the underside. And the trick is if anybody ever sees conks on the underside of their tree branches, that means that limb is very, very uh, close to death or it is dead on the inside and it's most likely hollow. So with something like that, with it disaffecting the branch right there, uh, it might be a situation where you can just prune off that branch and the tree will be just fine. Uh, if you do prune it, do not do anything to the wound. Do not paint it. Do not put cement on it. Do not wrap it. Uh, if you do any of those, you're actually going to encourage the fungi to grow and then you're going to have a bigger problem and cause that tree to decline a lot faster. So it's definitely a good option to go in there and maybe cut off that branch this fall and let it heal over and see how it goes from there. All right, thanks, Amy. Elizabeth, this is a viewer who has roses that are, um, they think they're climbers, but, but their behavior during the season gets random. So this is what they look like early 
in June, and then they, then they do this. So they're wondering if, can we tell them is this a climber and if so, how to prune it and if it's not, what is going on here? And most of the time when you see that advantageous growth that is extreme and there's a lot of growth on a rose, more than likely it could be reverting back from the rootstock. Um, some roses are grafted onto a rootstock and oftentimes what will happen is if it's planted too deep or there's death of the top or the scion, you'll have the rootstock start to come up. And so more than likely with that much of advantageous growth throughout the growing season, um, the rootstock is just coming up and it reverted back to that species. So more than likely not a climber, um, just the rootstock. All right, we have a really excellent question that goes to each of you, which doesn't happen. This is a very loyal viewer who teaches kindergarten in Clarkson. Says, you know, if each one of the panelists were going to suggest one activity for kindergartners, what would it be? So Wayne, what would it be? I would suggest the painted lady butterfly rearing uh, project in the classroom. They get them, they start as little caterpillars, you put them in the dish full of uh, the food that they're gonna eat and they can watch them grow. And then when they turn into pupa, you can pin them up in the emergence cage, which is a big mesh cylinder, and then they can watch the butterflies come out. Very cool. All right, Zach, no chainsaws with kindergartners. Uh, no, they need to know, learn how to use chainsaws early on in their life. <laughs> uh, I would probably use uh, a, some kind of a seeding demonstration, maybe use perennial ryegrass and, you know, like the old chia pets that we used to have or something like that where they just have to keep them watered and it germinates in five to seven days, a really short little uh, uh, grass-growing demonstration. All right, Amy. Uh, mine would be being rots and spots. you got to get something fuzzy growing. Oh. to show that things, there are living things out there that are so small that we don't see at first. Um, laying out strawberries, some of them get all fuzzy, or the other one, go to your local box store and buy some cheap roses and put them in a bag, tie up the bag and let it sit for two days and they'll get beautiful botrytis in about two days. So it's, there's nothing there and all of a sudden we have something growing. Excellent. All right, Elizabeth, your turn. And mine, I, what I like to do with little ones is take seeds and you show them all the different types of seeds, like your big coconut versus your little tiny orchid seed and how many different sizes do we have. And then you take the little rubber glove and a cotton ball in the end and then you put different seeds and you watch them all germinate um, through the course of a week or something along those lines. So you can watch the seeds germinate and sprout. Excellent. Thank you. We have a round of questions from our viewers. This is from Sac City, Iowa. Wayne, it is an insect the size of a June bug, oblong, and it looks like a fine tweed, dark brown and gray, eating holes in the tomatoes. What is it and how to treat it? Wow. You can pass. I only have to pass on that one. That's a picture one. That's a picture Don't for pass our it to the turf guy. <laughs> Don't pass it to the turf <laughs> guy. Okay, we'll give you this one instead. This is a Burwell viewer. There is a grass with soft blades, very narrow, bluish green. If you pull it, you get a whole handful. Comes up real late. <laughs> <laughs> this dumbfounded face. That was a great shot, guys. Uh, like I'll buffalo, pass to the entomologist. Like is it? Is it? Yeah. Uh, is it the like annual? Uh, we need be, pictures for that one. Picture yeah. On that one I, does it come up buffalo, really late? Buffalo, buffalo, buffalo Maybe grass. Buffalo grass. But buffalo grass is there all the time, and so it's not like it comes up. It's well, it just doesn't green, green until yeah. maybe they're not so, paying attention. The, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I would automatically think of an annual grass that would um, emerge comes up late. Yeah. But I, uh, picture next year. Yeah, I'm making fun of the entomologist, and I'm no better. <laughs> okay, so let's Welcome see. To the club. Down here on the it, end I of the say, table. Is this the panel? <laughs> this is a no. Bennett viewer, uh, Amy, who has zucchini. The whole pl one whole plant has turned yellow. Others nearby are fine. Lost some others to stem borers, but this is different. Uh, doesn't really see anything. Could it just be dead and gone, or is there some blight of zucchini? Um, you get powdery mildew, but that wouldn't cause it. Actually, you could have a crown rot. If you've been overwatering, i definitely look at that crown. If you're able to pull it up really fast and easy, it was definitely a crown rot. Um, always in the soil, just manage your water. Next year, especially if you have mulch, sometimes we can overwater and not realize it. All right, Elizabeth, this is a Fairberry viewer who has one of those grafted tomato plants. Uh, had all sorts of blossoms, has had lots and lots of blossoms, but hasn't had any tomatoes whatsoever. Any idea on that one? Have you seen that one 
yet. And I haven't seen the grafted tomatoes, but sometimes with tomatoes not setting fruit, it's just that they didn't get pollinated. And tomatoes are one of those wind pollinated ones. Um, and the temperatures have to be just right and the humidity has to be just right for that pollen grain to stick on there to actually produce a fruit. Um, so, you know, try again next year um, and see what happens. I guess my one question is if they planted it too deep, did the graft, did the bottom, the rootstock take over and sometimes they don't produce a fruit? So we haven't really had a lot of um, viewers call in about their experiences with grafted tomatoes and I know we have a couple in the backyard farmer garden. I'm just going to have to try to figure out where they are in the jungle of all the rest of our tomatoes and maybe we can answer that question either next week or next year mm -hmm. and go from there and hopefully give people tomatoes off those rather expensive tomato plants.